Well, thanks so much to Angel for having me. Um, unfortunately, obviously, I couldn't make it in person, but I'm really glad that uh, I'm still able to present virtually. And uh, thanks for being accommodating and, and moving my slots around just so uh, it was uh, still at a reasonable hour for me. And when um, Grace Brown and I, we were chatting um, some months ago, I think when we were talking about what we should discuss um, as part of the session, uh, I guess there was a consensus that we could talk about digital therapeutics simply because this is a, a new area and I think everybody's talking about it. And maybe we should just drill down and say, okay, what does it really mean? Is there a true opportunity here? And what does the future of this space look like? Um, and I guess Grace has done a great intro, so I'm not gonna really go into it, but I'd love to connect with all of you later and answer your questions as well. So um, this slide actually was really inspired by my friend and colleague, Lisa Sunin. And when she presented about a month ago in Barcelona, she actually, uh, she was talking about how a startup can make their mark in the United States. And she called it landing on the moon, um, the moon being the United States, but I've adapted some of that uh, and kind of made it my own here. Um, and adapted it to digital therapeutics. So I guess broadly speaking, if you're a digital health tool, do not assume you are a digital therapeutic. And I'll kind of add a bit more color on that shortly. Wellness and prevention are essential, but nobody wants to pay for them. And I guess this is essential here because most solutions we see lately are kind of going after the wellness and prevention space. And honestly, it is key. But I guess if we want to be a true therapeutic treating diseases and conditions, we also need to look at the, the harder and the more complex things to build. Evidence is king. This is ultimately the business of health and it's medicine and they want evidence and they demand evidence. So proof of concept is nice, proof of efficacy and value is nicer, but I guess make economic studies your friend because they wanna see cost savings. Um, regulation, obviously there's a lot of solutions today that technically don't have to comply with certain uh, regulations. However, you can safely assume that most of your customers wish that you had it. And reimbursement, when you build your digital therapeutic product, if you don't know who's going to pay for it, then um, nobody's ever going to pay. So on that happy note, I guess, what is a digital therapeutic? This is a framework that we launched in collaboration with the Digital Therapeutics Alliance and um, Node Health and Dime back in November 2019. And really, I guess we didn't want to overdefine anything, but we just wanted to clarify, you know, in the universe of digital health, uh, that digital medicines form a subset of digital health, and then finally digital therapeutics form a subset of this, which means it's a highly specialized area of digital health, just like a really specialized, say, molecule for a specific um, disease. And this framework is available all over the internet and happy to share um, with you as well. We kind of talk about, okay, what a digital therapeutic is, and I'll uh, touch on that in a second, but really what are the needs in terms of um, clinical evidence, regulation, reimbursement, and give you some um, examples of products that qualify as well. So I guess um, to keep it short, there are some core principles that all digital therapeutics must adhere to. So they must prevent, manage, or treat a disease. They must deliver a software-driven medical intervention. I guess that's what really differentiates them from a molecule. I guess there must be best practices followed um, across the table in design, manufacturing, quality, product development, et cetera, et cetera, uh, privacy, security. Um, they must undergo applicable regulatory reviews depending on what their claims are, and they must utilize uh, meaningful, actionable, kind of close the data loop in terms of real world outcomes as well. And they must produce robust clinical trials and publish the results in peer reviewed journals if they really wanna um, qualify and, and match what drugs currently do. So I kind of built out this framework really to draw out the comparisons between say a drug, whether it's a small molecule or a biologic or a large molecule and a digital therapeutic, right? So um, in a sense, both of them have a clearly defined clinical endpoint and are trying to treat or manage a particular condition. Then they are specific to a particular condition or disease or a therapeutic area in this case they need clinical validation. So obviously large scale RCTs are the norm for um, pharmacological molecules. And for digital therapeutics, I guess this is a little bit unknown in an ideal world. I'd, I'd say that's what we need for the medical community at large to adopt it, but also more so pragmatic real world trials because we don't really know how software is gonna play out um, on the health of individuals. In terms of regulation, I guess since a lot of you are logging in from Australia, it could be TGA or the FDA EMA, there needs to be regulatory oversight um, to both, as I've outlined here. 
prescribed by a physician in an ideal world, yes to both. However, just like uh, medications, there's also some over-the-counter digital therapeutics. They can be delivered in a monotherapy or a combination therapy. When we talk about digital therapeutics, it's really a combination therapy with a drug, so a drug-device combination. The drug-drug combination is yet to be explored. Uh, sorry, the device-device combination for a digital therapeutic is yet to be explored. And finally, the real-time continuous feedback loop, and I think this is where a digital therapeutic truly is different from a drug. Um, I guess it's in the brick and mortar settings of a, of a clinician's office where really they get the feedback from a patient who's taking uh, medication. And obviously these days we're add, adding on apps and softwares to track them. And essentially, I guess that's what a digital therapeutic enables to, to monitor them continuously in their own setting. What we've done at Health Excel is actually built out this landscape overview. Um, this is obviously representative of the world of digital therapeutics out there, but these are the solutions that we believe qualify and meet our definition of um, a digital therapeutic. And you, as you can see, there are a few different metrics here. So number one, we've kind of tracked them on a scale of you know, over-the-counter uh, digital therapeutics to those that need to be prescribed. And then we've also broken them down by therapeutic area that they address. So you'll clearly see there's a lot of activity around the self-consumption, clinical recommendation, and obviously chronic disease management as well. So we've kind of talked about a few different elements here. So we said direct to consumer or prescription digital therapeutics, and we've said it's a solo digital therapeutic or a drug device combination. So different kind of business models. So maybe we'll look at some that worked and some that haven't worked and what can we learn from it. So Livongo is a great example of a business model that has been so effective and impactful. So um, here are just some facts and I, I won't read each of them, but really over the last, um, we know last year Livongo went public, but more than that, I think it's, we started working with the Fortune 500 as their clients. So they've really gone after and doubled down on employee health plans because they know they're working in the wellness and prevention space. And so they went after people who would pay for that, right? And they've actually had over 200,000 uh, people enrolled in their plans, um, enrolled in their program in 2019. And what's really important about Livongo, and I think my observation is that it's not that Livongo is measuring blood glucose differently. It's not that they're not using a weighing scale to, to weigh you. They're still using these things, but what they've done is gift wrapped it nicely, right? So it's about bringing together all of these discrete and separate data points and giving you um, a holistic picture of what this really means for your well-being, for your health. And they've also not excluded uh, a very common occurrence, which is all the comorbidities like hypertension, obesity, et cetera, that comes alongside diabetes. So you can actually track and manage all of that together because that's really what happens in the real setting. It's not like you get diabetes separately and a different person gets hypertension and there's no correlation between the two. So that's something that's really worked well and is scaling. And then there are some things that didn't work, right? So um, this is not really to point fingers at anyone. So you'll, you'll see here, I guess, um, the image kind of outlines some of the key partnerships that have happened over the last couple of years between pharmaceutical companies and digital therapeutics companies. And I'm sure all of us here have heard that some of those didn't really work out. And these were really the poster children to take the commercialization strategy for digital therapeutics to the next level, right? There was an expectation and a hope almost from the industry. But I guess, this need not be a question of the viability of the prescription digital therapeutic market, but rather an assessment of the alignment with the strategic direction and the strategic focus of the pharmaceutical company in this partnership. And sometimes it doesn't really work out, right? And then another key element here is adoption. So whether the product is good or not, if physicians are unwilling to use it and prescribe it uh, to their patients, it's never really gonna scale. And I guess we've not really cracked that nut yet as an industry. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail about that in terms of how many physicians even have access to digital therapeutics to make available to their patients. And I think this is a key challenge in scaling uh, these type of uh, business models. But all said and done, I think there's so much to learn from here and uh, some lessons to, to take forward. So I don't really think it's all bad news. Okay, so I kind of want to go into a, a bit of detail on the key elements that I outlined earlier as must have, right? So clinical validation. So what we did is looked at that 
universe of digital therapeutic solutions. And we mapped about 67 companies. You saw a lot of those logos earlier um, in term, on that scale of uh, self-consumption to prescription digital therapeutics. And we outlined uh, all the studies that were published on PubMed, so in any peer-reviewed um, publication. And about 195 studies were mapped back to these 67 digital therapeutics companies. Honestly, that's really not that bad. And this is a fairly new space uh, and an emerging area as well. So, however, I must draw a caveat here. There are a number of these companies that do have much more evidence that they've published in the form of, say, bench tests or smaller tests. However, this might be sitting on their website and it's not really in a peer reviewed um, uh, publication. And honestly, that doesn't really cut it for the medical community. And, and that is the real challenge. And there's also non uniformity in terms of the types of studies, right? So there are RCTs, but some of them are just feasibility and usability studies. So it's really difficult to compare them because they're not, um, they're, diff they're apples and oranges, really. And here's some more numbers just to give you a bit more context. So I guess one of the one of the questions we get asked most is there's so much money going into the sector and is it really worth the investment, right? And I guess one lens to look at it uh, at is clinical validation. So the five uh, top funded digital therapeutics companies on the left-hand side, you'd see, are they the ones that produce the most evidence? Maybe, maybe one or two of them. But then on the right-hand side here, you'll see some of the not top, I guess, but well-funded companies have produced um, a decent amount of evidence. But I think a lot, a lot is left to be uh, or left for, to desire in terms of what we want to see in clinical validation. I just wanted to bring this up, uh, even though it's a little bit tangential, because if we want to run trials on software products um, and digital tools, then I guess the challenge we have is how we actually measure the biomarkers, right? The clinical endpoints are still probably the same, but how we're measuring it is what is different. And this brings in, uh, this kind of opens up Pandora's box of digital biomarkers. And here's just a sample of some of the different measurements that can be measured by different technologies. And I guess then you take that a step back and say, okay, how do we then track these back to clinical endpoints that are meaningful and therefore um, generate evidence to prove that our product actually works? We spoke a little bit about the adoption challenges, right? And so this is this just adds a bit more color on it and gives you kind of the scale. Um, this is a slide from um, IQBIA AppScript. And really what they have done is actually study the adoption um, as it stands. This is from 2019. So in the United States, only about 4% of physicians have access to any digital therapeutic to prescribe. And this is being made available through enabling platforms like Zelf and Rx Universe and AppScript. That is tiny. So I guess everybody who's listening to this is a self-selected audience of people who know the space, are passionate about it, or want to learn about it, but we are not in this 4%, right? And in the UK, I guess it was still the same. It was, much, it was quite a small number, however, IQVIA um, AppScript last year partnered with EMIS. Now, EMIS is the largest electronic medical record provider for especially the GP services in the NHS. So by virtue of being on this default EMR, they actually now um, give access to a number of digital therapeutics that are on, um, on EMIS to these GPs. And therefore, I guess there is hope that they will uh, prescribe some of these. The benefit the NHS has also is that anything that is approved to be on EMIS or AppScript's platform has most certainly passed all the necessary regulatory um, guidelines from NICE. Okay, so this is just a bit of detail on some of the um, platforms. I'm not gonna go into the detail, but I'm sure when we share the slides, you can access it. The final challenge is getting paid, right? So I guess this is the, this is the question that remains, who, who really pays for it? And like I said earlier, if you don't at the start, you probably never know. What are some of the key things that a payer looks for when they um, decide if they want to cover or pay for a solution, right? Number one, clinical performance. Number two, continuous, meaningful, actionable, real-world evidence. Clinical efficacy. So support from um, peer-reviewed publications. And finally, impact on the medical resource utilization. So you need to show evidence of cost savings. And I guess that's key. I found a really interesting survey here on how many digital therapeutics are already being covered by different payers? 
And here it's, it says 23%. I suspect that the 23% actually includes all the employer health plans for covering the Omadas and Livongas of the world. But about 40% of them have said that in the next two years, they see themselves paying for digital therapeutics uh, solutions. So what are some of the barriers to payment? It will be that there are no codes at the moment. There's no standardized pricing. There's not sufficient uh, peer reviewed literature. And finally, there are no payment models as well. So, okay, what does all of this mean, right? This has been, this been quite a bit. Where do we go from here? Build the roads first. So the issue is I think we've kind of built a really um, fancy train, but we lack some of the, the railroad tracks. So we need to build a fundamental infrastructure to prescribe, to, to distribute, to reimburse and provide service. And then evidence, I think I've spoken quite strongly about the need for evidence to make digital therapeutics the normal. Gift wrap it, like from the example of Livongo, position your offerings in, in the most effective way possible and actually just play on things that already exist and have already been established and proven. Consortia to lead the way to build regulatory frameworks. So what do I mean by this? I guess it's not any one person or one body's responsibility to really build the regulatory frameworks for digital therapeutics. And it kind of sits with all of us. So it should be groups of pharmaceutical companies, of digital therapeutics, entrepreneurs, of regulatory bodies, all of them coming together to really lead the way because we're all kind of facing uncharted waters. So it, it's a responsibility, a collective responsibility of the entire industry to come together. And finally, double down on areas that are ripe for optimization, right? So it's very clear that digital therapeutics can play a role and has been proven to some extent in some clinical areas and some therapeutic areas. And we really need to double down on those opportunity spaces before we go and try new things and explore new things while we've not yet proven 100% value in, um, in the existing ones. So yeah, so that's me. Maybe I'll stop my share. Should I, should I continue to share? Let's leave you on mute um, so we can have a chat and I'll talk you through some of the questions that have come through um, throughout the, your session. Thank you so much. I mean, I had one right at the beginning, so I'm just going to jump in with that. But when you, when you brought out that definition with Node and, and the others um, around digital health, digital medicine, digital therapeutics, it was actually something that the industry was, was really needing at the, at the time and sort of still needs some clarification on. But was there any uh, controversy or pushback um, that surprised you when you brought out that quite well thought out um, definition system? Yeah, that's a great question. And absolutely. Actually, let me turn on the video here. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I guess one of the key things we got back was, well, obviously lots of people said this was important and this was needs, etc. Things we also got is that maybe we overdid it, right? We cooked it and kind of put it and um, uh, I guess put in too many definitions and descriptions. While I, I think there's some truth on both sides, which is why to be honest, we could challenge, and I, I can say this even from just some of the examples I've given there, we could challenge um, if some of those are digital therapeutics. I, mean, I guess, is YouTube a digital therapeutic? If I watch like CBT module. So there's always some challenges, I think, when you put out uh, frameworks like this. But I think there was consensus throughout that it was just a really good starting point to clarify. Thank you. I mean, I think that was something that we really needed at the time and we still need is this clarification, especially when we have large um, health data groups also using the term digital health correctly for them. And so there's a bit of um, overlap there. Um, I had a question from Adam Wardell from Provisor um, about whether you could comment on the positioning of digital therapeutics initially as adjuncts to treatments. And will that impact the longer term credibility of digital therapeutics in practice if they are presented to the market as only adjuncts and then later we want them to stand alone? What do you think about the credibility? So, so I'd say the one who positions themselves as an adjunct needs to, it's, it's a totally different value proposition than one who says that they're going to treat something completely digitally. So 
it's a huge claim or a really big jump to say, okay, we don't need the drug anymore. And, and therefore, I don't actually think that we're close to, to achieving that. So if something's in a jump to a drug, then it's only just, its value truly comes out when it's taken with the pill only. And then those who are going kind of the, just use, use our digital therapeutic as the entire management of your condition, it's different. I actually do not think that we can make that jump yet. And kind of on that, there's quite a few questions sort of beautiful there, um, coming out like a tree from that sort of comment because one's that partnering. So what are digital health and therapeutics um, looking from big, big pharma, big device companies, other than just funding, how can they partner um, and what partnership models would make it a true long-term collaboration? You gave some examples of things that didn't work out. Yeah, so something about um, partnership models with device companies and pharma companies that could work in the long term, hypothetically. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> Recently, we did some work with a group of pharmaceutical companies to really identify what does it take to successfully partner um, with startups or, or other smaller companies, right? I think number one, it really depends on where along the maturity journey of pharmaceutical companies are they fully ready to to you know, go ahead with this partnership. Sometimes some of them are just kind of trying pilots and just dabbling early on and you then know, and it's really difficult to judge from the outside if they're fully ready um, to take this to, to completion, right? That's one piece. The second thing is, is an alignment and strategic fit really. Do they actually have a product portfolio that aligns with whatever your digital therapeutic offers, right? And while, while it might, seem okay in theory, I guess that they'll develop a whole new revenue line that that will only sell software products. We're far away from that. So if they do not currently have a drug in the pipeline, it's very unlikely that you fit strategically into their existing revenue streams. And then that partnership is going to be really challenging. So that's another thing to keep in mind. And third, uh, I guess in general, we, we cannot assume that just pharma will be able to commercialize a digital therapeutic. I think it's a partnership. So there's cultural understanding and kind of fits that both parties have to figure out as they go. And, uh, you know, so there's just a lot of different pieces to, to developing a successful partnership. Obviously, as well as partnerships, people are looking for funding. Um, do you think that venture capital firms are starting to see the potential of these interventions um, not just the digital health and digital medicine, but actually digital therapeutics um, in the venture capital investment space. Absolutely, as evidenced by a lot of money going into it. So I do think that they see the value and, and the potential that the space uh, offers, but that's all I can say at the moment. And I guess it is promising that we've seen a few companies um, go public last year. That is, as if that is the end goal um, that you desire to achieve. And one of which was the digital therapeutic and that's Livongo. So um, absolutely, I, I think they see an area for that's ripe for um, investment. But I think there's also more clarity now on some of the challenges so going forward, I think more questions will be asked than say a couple of years ago. Um, Anne Bannister has asked you, Chandana, what strategies you've observed that end that perpetual pilot cycle um, on the way to health sales with health sales cycles being so long? Um, have you observed some good news stories around ending that pilot cycle? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I don't think I have as good an answer, but I think it really reflects back on where along their journey a pharmaceutical company is, since we're talking about pharma here, but it could be any large co corporation that is partnering with a smaller company. So if they're really ready to, to transform or to disrupt, then I think um, they'll do much more than pilot, but if they're just kind of figuring it out and they have a, and if they don't have a mandate, say a clear leadership team that can drive this through to the end, it's gonna be really challenging if you only have couple of managers who are really pushing hard on this agenda. And it's tricky, right? And can you assess it up front? Maybe, maybe not. And sometimes if you lose your internal champions in a lot of these cases, whether it's a health system where I think it's even more evident or in a pharmaceutical company, that could also mean an end for a partnership. So 
Uh, I'm afraid I don't necessarily have the golden rules, but these are just some some things to bear in mind. And following up from that, to um, just to pass on some wisdom that someone shared with us recently in another event, they uh, someone asked the same question about pilots, and they were talking about in Australia and probably smaller organisations like maybe one hospital or something like that. Um, and they said, look, if you're going to go in through, say, innovation program in a hospital or through a foundation program in a hospital. Um, to ask them right up front if they can sign a non-binding letter of intent that if X, Y, and Z happens, they will implement it. And it doesn't matter really how unbinding it is. It was about getting that hospital or organisation to think about how that would work from the beginning. So, if that so, so that means if you lose your champion or that means the person you're working with in the innovation group at that hospital who's doing your six-week pilot has already started that conversation with Jennifer, who's the next person down the chain, because I needed to start that conversation to help yeah. write this letter. Even though the letter's not binding, that's not the point. The point is to start those conversations early, because often you'll get to the end of your six-week successful pilot, and then they'll say, oh, we have to ask Jennifer, and they wouldn't have even started that conversation. So getting that conversation started up front um, with the organisation that you're working with, that it was, it was some advice we were recently given as well. Yeah, sounds like a great tip. Someone's also asked about global data storage and data use. So a lot of digital health companies all around the world are collecting patient data and they want to monetize it in various ways. And your health Excel is obviously global. So what sort of different approaches are you seeing in the different major jurisdictions around that, around patient data use? Yeah, I think once again, we're kind of learning from bruises, from being bruised, right, a few times in the last couple of years. And I guess there's an inherent trust um, in most of these solutions that that data will be used in the right way that it, it should be. Um, however, there have been breaches. So I believe that depending on where the, the product is being made, they must comply with the data privacy and regulations of that region, um, depending on where it's made and where they intend to market it. Um, that's number one. And that's not to say some companies cannot sell data without actually um, getting consent from the patients, right? So for example, there's a company that um, works out of Mexico and LATAM, um, actually an American company, and they're called Doc.com, but really what they do is it's very transparent to the patients upfront that um, they can take free telemedicine consults in exchange for obviously completely de-identified, anonymized and aggregated data of theirs that will then be leveraged to make different healthcare decisions. And, and there's that level of transparency, which I think is really key as well. So, yeah. Um, you're on mute. Anyone out there who has any additional questions, please um, do send them through because it's really uh, fantastic to have your brain on this. And don't be afraid for those who have their own companies to ask some quite specific questions um, because this is you know, a great time to access someone at quite a late hour of the night from your perspective. Um, HealthXL does a lot of, well, correct me, does some matching between large organisations and, and, and some uh, emerging companies. What are some tips that emerging companies in the audience might do to make themselves most attractive to larger organizations? You touched on something before about generally understanding their need, but um, you might have some other ones as well. Yeah, so while we don't actually do um, kind of that kind of matchmaking, but we do put lots of interesting companies that are relevant for some of the larger companies based on their strategy or their need in that moment in front of them. So the criteria for decision-making really is heavily dependent on who we're making it for. So let's say pharma company X comes to us and they're looking for a very specific solution that's of a certain level of funding and maturity. They've, uh, you know, um, run X number of, uh, they have so much evidence, they're in X number of markets. So there's some really clear criteria and we make sure we kind of stick to it. And sometimes, honestly, you don't need to have anything. They might just be looking for a spark and a, and a great idea. So what I'm trying to say is that there's, a really good opportunity for all kinds of different people, but there are some absolute must do's like evidence generation that must exist. Um, like figuring out, do you need to comply with certain regulatory frameworks that has to be done and to have a plan in place for 
how they intend to make money or commercialize, even if it's not in flight. I think these are some of the, the key needs and the ability to partner or are they partner ready based on some existing partnerships that they may have or some of the pilots that they may have uh, participated in. Look, Tangela, thank you so much for your time this evening. We've got quite the late hour in Dublin. Um, and I know you're going to miss out on the round of applause, which is part of the, the issue of the virtual. But we can give you one here in the office. Um, and thank you for your time and for, for dialing in today and for answering everyone's questions. Thank you for having me.